still turning there, there are <clears throat> a couple of people to keep in prayer. Uh, we need to keep Zeke in prayer, <clears throat> one of the twins. He's uh, been to the hospital today once, got back home, and <clears throat> and he was uh, had been, I forget, d diagnosed with something that had led to dehydration, and he got home and he started throwing up, which is never a good thing when you're already dehydrated. <clears throat> And, um, um, well, just keep Mike and Patty in your prayers also, amen? And, uh, and we'll just keep Claudia in our prayers, too. <coughs> well, it's good to have Jill here, and um, Dougie's nephew, what, what was your name again? Mike, well, how could I forget that? We have several Mikes <coughs> in our fellowship. It's good to have you all here with us, and we love you, Jill. And uh, um, all right, <laughs> are you sure about that? <laughs> okay, Philippians two. I want to use the sandwich approach tonight and that is has nothing to do with food it <clears throat> it has to do with first reading what's inside the sandwich and then seeing the two pieces of bread on the other side <clears throat> in other words reading the meat of the scriptures and then there are scriptures in front of it and and that follow it that help us to uh, gain context what is the what is what is the Lord trying to say to us? And that's, that's all that matters anyway, isn't it? I mean, we're not, <clears throat> we're not trying to be theologians or scholars or whatever. We want to know the Lord, and one of the best ways to do that is what Jesus said in John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, for they are they which testify of me. So we're in Philippians 2. <clears throat> I want to read the meat of it first, and that begins with verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, <clears throat> but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And you could say he humbled himself even further. I mean, think about everything that was just written in front of this that we just read. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself further and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And then verse 9, wherefore, and that is a key word there that we'll be, we will be uh, addressing several times throughout the course of this, this particular course that we're in. Wherefore, God also hath highly... <clears throat> exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> All right now that's the meat that's the that's the center part of the sandwich but we want to look at the bread on either side. And on one side will be verses 1 through 4 that lead up to it. And on the other side is once that, those verses finish that we just read, 11, it'll be um, 12 and 13. So the heart of that verse relates to Christ going lower and lower and lower uh, when he is God and he has every power and every ability available to him as God, he doesn't choose the way of power and ability and rights <clears throat> and privileges, but instead he becomes a servant, he <clears throat> becomes a man, becomes a servant, then, you know, becomes obedient unto death. So the verses in front of it, <clears throat> verse 1, if there be therefore 
any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tender mercies and compassions, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Okay, and then it goes into our meat. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> then the other piece of bread on the other side, beginning with verse 12. Uh, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who's working in you. You work out what God is working in you. <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> both, but it's God working in you both to will and to do of my good pleasure, of his good pleasure. Uh, and then uh, do all things without murmuring and disputing. And if you keep going, it's uh, be blameless and harmless, the children of God. Uh, all right. So in the cent center part from verse 5 to um, 11, <clears throat> it looks sort of like a theological uh, treatise. It looks like a, the setting forth of the doctrine of Jesus on the cross and the doctrine of Jesus in his incarnation and, and all of this stuff. But you find out when you take the sandwich approach, you read what's in front of it and what's behind it. He's dealing with people and he's dealing with people in their particular problems. And he is, uh, <clears throat> he is suggesting, he's going beyond suggesting because this is the word of God and it is the Lord. But he is suggesting that God wants something at work in you that was at work in Christ crucified. Not Christ, not Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, think about it. I mean, everybody wants to refer to Jesus of Nazareth, but he died and Christ crucified became Lord of all. All right. That we will take some really good time in the future to cover in a major way and see that throughout the scriptures. All right, so um, he says, you know, we, we read this last week um, in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 21, that to me, to live is Christ. Here he says, it is God at work in you. It is God in you. It's God at work in you. And he's dealing with you in terms of your will and your doing, but all according to a certain mind, the mind of Christ. Not the brain of Christ, you know, not the thoughts of Christ. I mean, if you take that seriously, you know, you, obviously you know that there's not going to be a surgeon that will open up, take your brain out, and put Jesus's in. But if you take the other part seriously, it's not going to be about your thoughts or Christ's thoughts in you. Because the, you can say that the scriptures are Christ's thoughts, Jesus's thoughts. So I'm just going to memorize the scriptures, and that's what he meant. No. He has defined it. Perfectly. The Pharisees had the scriptures memorized. Is that right or wrong, you know? They knew the scriptures better than you or I do, but they didn't know the Lord in the scriptures. And Jesus said, that's in John 5, 39, that's who he was talking to was the Pharisees. You know, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. So that means that there is a concept of eternal life that is not Christ. It's just a gift that he gives. And that's, that's wrong. He gives himself. He gave himself. And he always is self-giving in, in what he does. <clears throat> All right. So, um, so 
the Apostle Paul is honing in, and we, we went through the very last part of our last class, we went through many scriptures throughout Philippians and showed that this is not a foreign concept. He's talking about Christ in you, and he's talking about Christ crucified in you, and these scriptures are, are bearing that out also. <clears throat> All right, uh, keeping your place there, but let's go to 2 Corinthians <clears throat> Chapter 6. And I'm going to take a little bit different approach tonight in, in my direction, the same, same study, but I want to, I want to go through a, a bunch of different scriptures that, that are basically familiar to people, especially in the Old Testament. And I want to show that the Word of God is declaring Christ. It is not trying to make good Christians out of us. It's trying to get Christ formed in his body. Now, there's no need, in my opinion, for us to call ourselves his body if Christ can't live in us. <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. Let's get real. You know, we can be religious and we can, I believe this and I believe that, but it's, it, the, the point is not to believe this and that. The point is, as Paul described in, in Galatians 4.19, that Christ may be formed in you. And he said, I travail in birth. This was, this was the leadership of the first church. They had a burden. And it wasn't just world evangelization, folks. The burden was for the church. And his prayers and his travail was for the church. Um, anybody ever seen problems in the church anywhere? Yeah. You know. Okay, so we're, so, you know, now we're the guy, you know, the church, here we are. We're the ones with all the answers. When we can't even forgive, we can't even get over a little problem. Somebody said something wrong or somebody said something right about it. Somebody said, well, you, you know, Randy, you, you know, you're too what? I don't know, you know. You're too nice. No, not. <laughs> but uh, I wish somebody would say that. But, <clears throat> you know, it, w they would say something that would be true about us and we would get our feelings hurt. Well, that's not the end of the world. You know, that's not. And to really, and to take that patiently, Peter talks about this, and to take that patiently is not thankworthy to God. He expects if he, somebody says something that's true about you, you just take it. You know, it says, if, it, if they accuse you falsely, that's when, you know, that, that's when you, go, you embrace the cross and you've really joined with him in this thing. Can I get an old me? <clears throat> All right. So, um, so God, uh, uh, and you, you sense that through his prophets of the Old Testament, and you sense that through the true men of God in the New Testament, is, man, they've got his heart, and his heart rates, relates to Christ being formed in his body, and that's what's going to change the world, not Christianity. Christ, you know, get mad at me if you will, Christianity has failed, but Jesus has never failed. Christianity has failed in just love, just the basic things, basic Christianity. Christianity has failed in basic Christianity, forgiving, loving one another, you know, doing unto others as you'd have. Come on. I mean, let's just get real on that point. I mean, it's, Christianity has failed to do Christianity. Okay, well then, if it's not doing Christianity, what's it doing? You know, I mean, I'm just... You know, I'm just thinking out loud now. Um, well, it's not important, really, ultimately, where the church has failed, where the pastor has failed, or this has happened, or that has happened. What is important is that Christ be lifted up above all that, and our Philippian scripture gives us that. Through the cross, only is he exalted on high. He healed, he blessed, miracles, wonderful things happened when Jesus walked the earth and he wasn't exalted until he laid down his life and then was raised up. Amen. All right. So, we're in 2 Corinthians 6 and 16. <clears throat> um, 
And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. All right. So he's just stating a little fact here. <laughs> it seems so simple because every Christian believes and already says, yeah, we're the temple of God. But the temple of God is where God dwells. What, what the, let's just take it on a Jewish front. What the Jews, the Jewish people said, oh, that's the temple. That's the house of worship for us. But God would look over there and go, well, that's where I live. Right? That was his house. <laughs> okay? We made it a house of religion. But, okay, well, that's just old covenant right there. That's not even new covenant. New covenant is we're the temple, folks. And are we, are we worse than the Jews? In that we call ourselves the temple, but it's not his house. And, you know, we say, well, Jesus lives in me. Well, he's in you. I don't know how much he's living. You're doing a lot of it. <laughs> well, I'm, you know, <laughs> a whole lot of it's you, you know. And, and it's become, the temple has become your house. And, you know, Jesus has been evicted or certainly shut up and locked in a closet, you know. <clears throat> All right. So, but notice, notice his wording here. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? All right, okay. You know, think throughout the old, all the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, all the way to John, back at you know, First John, Second, Third John. What is this obsession God has with idols? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, he seems to, he seems to. Oh, I mean, it was in the Ten Commandments, for God's sake. I mean, it's there. It's a biggie to him. All right. We go, well, I don't know why, why that would even be mentioned in the New Testament. We're not heathen. You know, we don't have idols. <clears throat> Anybody ever heard of an American idol? No, I'm sorry, just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's just the name of the show. All right, so here's my question for you. Does God hate, does God hate idols, or does he want to preserve his true image? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, to really get the answer to that, we have to start back at the first. Let's go to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. And this all does relate to Philippians, and it's all based on Philippians. <clears throat> but it's going to take us through a whole bunch of Old Testament scriptures to find the New Testament uh, meaning of that and what God had in mind. <clears throat> Exodus, chapter 20. I'm going to start with verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, who have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that's in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. All right, so we'll stop right there. A <clears throat> um, couple of just quick things to note that I'm not quite ready to comment on, but obviously, uh, most of this, I am the Lord thy God, and he says it a couple of times, and he's trying to emphasize that there's a him that we need to know. Not just know there's a God. Not just, oh, I believe, you know, uh, are you a Christian? Yeah. Well, do, you believe, do you believe God exists? Yeah, I believe God exists. Well, you know, do you know Jesus? or what? No, but I, I believe God exists. Well, you know, so does the devil. 
He does too. <laughs> and he's not a Christian. Well, he might be. <laughs> but he doesn't have Christ formed in him. <clears throat> I'm joking. He's not a Christian. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> that's the same truth for a whole lot of people who claim that also. <clears throat> All right. So uh, that's one of the points. And then, you know, he says that um, I, I am... I am the Lord, thy God, who brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And, and uh, he says, you know, don't have any other gods before me. <clears throat> and then he, there he says that he's a jealous God. He's a jealous God. All right. Um, now, my question is, really, God? I mean, you're, you know, you're, you have problems with petty jealousy? over wood and stone? I'm, I'm just trying to get you to think. You know, instead of having the same old viewpoint that everybody feeds you, we need to wake up and say, God, is there any other way of viewing this reality of idols than, than just wood and stone out there? And is God really just, you know, I mean, that's one of the things I always hated about the Greek gods, Zeus and all that stuff. Man, they fought no, they were worse than the people on the planet you know what I mean? <laughs> they were so stinking petty it was ridiculous you know so then I'm going to come to Jesus and I'm going to go you know and he's going to go well you know I'm just I'm just jealous all the time I don't mean to be I just uh, <laughs> you know there has to be a, a deeper meaning can I get amen I mean there has to be a deeper meaning than just you know he he's uh, just regularly if he sees you with somebody you know, he's yeah, he's insecure. Uh, <clears throat> but what if, what if his jealousy had to do with how he will be viewed or portrayed to us and by us, to everyone else? What if it really had to do with idols or a wrong image or a wrong view of him? And, and that it was, and that, that he was jealous over that he have the right, he, he be given, as it were, the right view. <clears throat> All right, let's uh, go back to the New Testament so that we can confirm a few little things here. Let's go to this time, 1 Corinthians. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 8. <clears throat> Now, some of you are well familiar with this chapter because I taught 1 Corinthians a couple of semesters back. And I really dealt with this chapter 8 thing here. Um, <clears throat> let's see, let's start with verse 4. <clears throat> As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. Okay. If you just take that right there, Paul says, and he'll go on to say, there's one God and we know that there are no actual gods and whatever. So is God really jealous over something that doesn't even exist? You see, you, you see what I'm saying? Or does, or does Paul, the writer of Corinthians, has he actually gotten God's view concerning these things? And he is seeing it in a greater perspective than just based on human emotions and reactions and, and petty, I want this and I don't want that and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> so, verse 5, for though there be though that that are called gods, they're called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there are gods many and lords many. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. And so here he's basically stated his view you know, the, you remember the issue. The issue was 
that they were in Corinthian Corinth, and in Corinth there was there was not a whole lot of Jews, and there were a lot of uh, of pagans and heathens that got one to the Lord, and and so they would go to. Uh, I'll just put it like this. They would go to the synagogue or whatever. They would go to the meetings and stuff. But they would also go into the idols' temples because they had feasts and they would sit down and they would eat the food and stuff like that. And so uh, the general idea was that this was offered to idols. All right. So Paul just states a, a theological view. Look, that, you know, there's only one God. There are no other gods you know, there's no need for us to really get upset all about that. that but, then, but then he brings in another aspect here. <clears throat> and that is verse 7. However, <laughs> so he's, he's stated his theological point, but he feels like there's something beyond theology. Theology is the study of God. What would be beyond theology? How about just God? <laughs> The study of God's good, God is better. All right. <clears throat> However, there is not in every man that knowledge for some uh, with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food commendeth us not to God for neither if we eat are we better or neither if we uh, eat not are we the worse. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee who has knowledge sitting at the table in idols' temples, shall not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Uh, wherefore, if food make my brother to offend, I will eat no meat while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. All right. <clears throat> so here he's dealing with idols, and it appears that the idol is the in the 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 uh, pagan temple, and it's the stone thing or a wooden thing that they've set up with some sort of figure or whatever. <clears throat> and 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 Paul is saying no. That's not the real temple. We're the temple, and, and that's not the real God. We follow and serve the real God. <clears throat> but then he says, but you know what? All that's theology. And he said, because he, he basically says, uh, um, you know, it doesn't, you're not, if you eat or don't eat, or none the better. That's not the issue. He says, that's, that's fact. But make sure your knowledge isn't offending and hurting others and causing a stumbling block to other people. And he's saying, I have every right to eat. I have every right to, to enjoy this. I, uh, you know, I'm an adult here. I know the truth. I, you see what I mean? He's going off on all this. I have rights. I'm an adult. I know the truth. Da, 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 da. And he says, basically what he's saying is, but that's not Christ. <laughs> and he's saying anything that's not Christ is an idol. You're really serving the idol but not in stone in that temple you're serving another image of him that is not his true image wait we're not done <clears throat> all right so uh let's go back to the old testament now let's go to leviticus 26 <clears throat> And verse 1. <clears throat> Leviticus 26, verse 1. Page 162. In my Bible. You shall make no idols, nor carved image, neither rear you up a, a standing image, Neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. All right. So he's reiterating, but he's added a few little things there. And one of the things is that he says you shall not bow down to it. <clears throat> All right. I'm just going to give you a little hint right now with what we're talking about. It's in Philippians. It says every knee shall bow. 
and confess Jesus Christ, Lord of all. Okay, so he has, he has swung the sword of the Spirit here at anything that involves bowing to something other than the one who died and God raised. All right. All right. So now let's get to another really good one, this one. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Fifteen. Are you putting stuff up there? <laughs> Deuteronomy four fifteen. <clears throat> we'll read on down past that, but take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spoke unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Okay, what's it talking about? It's talking about when Moses went up on Mount Sinai and he met with God and then later on he brought all the elders. Remember that? He went up there and this is Moses talking to him and he's saying, look, I'm telling you, be careful. When we went up there, God didn't show us his form or an image or anything like that. Make sure that you don't do that. So let's... let's um, <clears throat> um, Let's read it again. The Lord commanded... Oh, wait a minute. Where are we at? Verse 15. Um, take heed, therefore, good... Uh, take ye, therefore, good heed unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spoke unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a carved image, the similitude of any figure the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that's on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters, um, beneath the waters. <clears throat> Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, uh, shouldest be driven to worship them, and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided all nations under the whole heaven. <clears throat> all right. So here he has gotten real specific. And I remember when I first read this when I was in Bible school, and I thought, okay, so there is no, there is no image that we can give of God. Now, you know for a fact in the scripture, several places, Hebrews chapter 1 for 1, it says that Jesus is the express image of God. All right. So, but we need to, we need to see that in the fullness of, of what it's talking about. <clears throat> all right. So, it, what it has done is it has gone through all, I mean, it, it's, it's covered, it's covered all kinds of creatures. And it's saying, be careful, based on what you have seen, you didn't see a similitude up there when you were with God. All right. <clears throat> Again, we're working our worst somewhere. All right, let's go to the book of Revelation. This is making up for the times I, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> All right, so the book of Revelation has some things to say to us. I mean, it's the last book in the Bible. There we, we're going to get a wrap up. Jesus says, I'm the beginning and the end. So that's good. I mean, if he's the beginning and the end, then we can have assurance if, our, if we're seeking Jesus if we're seeking to conform to his image, if we're seeking Christ to be formed in us instead of doing good Christian deeds, then we're going to be okay. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Okay. <laughs> Can I say it again? You can't go wrong with Jesus. And you can't go wrong with emphasizing Jesus. All right. <clears throat> all right. Uh, Revelation 5 verse 1. 
And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, <clears throat> sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? All right, just that much right there, there's this book, there's this scroll, this book, this thing that, that uh, they're trying to open. And there is a strong angel, a strong angel, and he's flying through heaven to everybody who's ever made it. Can I put it that way? <laughs> okay, that means all of the good people, that's the best of the best, and I'm not talking about good people good per people here. I'm talking about David and Abraham and Paul and, you know, Peter, and you understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Peter, people that, you know, we can admire. And they're there. This is the book of Revelation. This angel, this strong angel is flying through and he's saying, who is worthy to open the book? That, the word of God says that it was a strong angel. A strong angel, okay? And, it, and that angel didn't say, who is strong enough to open this? He said, who is worthy? Who is worthy? Because worthiness, according to what God believes and sees, is going to have to do with Christ. Because you remember the only sacrifice that was ever worthy was, was a, a lamb without spot or blemish. The only gift, the only thing, everything that they ever offered to God, Israel ever offered to God on those altars and anything else was a picture and type of Christ, the only one worthy. You know, so what do we do? We say, well, now we're, we're saved, so we're worthy. No, Jesus is still the one that's worthy, but he lives in us. And we can, we can let him do the work that we can't do instead of, you know, I can't do it yet, yeah, you know, and all the things that, all the things that we wrestle with. Well, this, this thing is, this is so much bigger than me. This, the, Goliath is just huge. You remember David was 16 years old and all of Israel, all of the mighty men, all of the armed men, all of the soldiers of Israel stood there and Goliath walked back and forth and he didn't just, you know, say, come on, fight me. He, he said horrible things to those people. Say, you wimps, get out of here. You sissies, you know, sorry, that's the, Probably as bad as I can get. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and railing on them. And anybody ever had something so big in your life that it just seemed to rule you and mock you and stuff like that? And all of those men, David's 16 years old. You know what his, his job description was? He was a, a shepherd. Oh, but he was God's shepherd meaning he was with God. All right. Well, wasn't everybody in Israel? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, well, that, that, we can say, we can say that David was a man after God's heart. <clears throat> All right. So we can, you can reverse that statement. You can say, well, David was a man after God's heart, meaning God went, oh, you know, you're just so special. Or we can say, David was a man after God's heart. I want to know your heart, not your head, not your theology. Because remember, David, David uh, um, went against some of the theological things that were taught in the day, and God still blessed him. But there were those who did everything right, and God didn't bless them. <clears throat> because why? Because it's not right, about right or wrong. It's not about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's about the tree of life. So David has got this life thing with God, this connection with God. Uh, you know, I mean, he, when he talks about the Bible, remember what he said? The Bible, he said, he said, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Every other Jew said, well, it's written just the way it's supposed to be. It's literal. Just read it and do it. But that wasn't David. David said, I, I need my eyes opened. I want, I, you know, and this is the guy. And see, he's not, he's not, you know, it's not like David isn't ever in the word or with the Lord. And he's sitting there watching the sheep. And 
Then one day, somebody comes and says, David, my God, you need to get over here to the city. There's a giant, and man, he is mad, and he's mean, and he's big, and his weapons are huge, and man, everybody's just freaking out. And Anyway, we decided you need to fight him. Come on. And David go, oh, i got to get in the word. Anybody ever done that? You know, it's like, you know, your shield of faith, the, the fiery darts are already let loose and on their way to you. And then you realize that you're fixing to get hit and you grab your shield. But faith takes a few minutes. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word. So, so, you're, you, so you start in and you hadn't built your faith up and all of a sudden, boom, 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 whoosh, you know, all this fire starts, you know, and you're going, you know. Well, we're not just talking about faith for BMWs or anything like that. We're talking about faith in the Lord. And, that, and David did have it. Faith in the Lord and that he didn't go in his own mind and he didn't go in his own strength. In fact, he didn't have any strength. And he was 16 years old. So he, but he just happens along. He's just a delivery boy. The father said, bring this lunch to your brothers. <laughs> you know, he's not going, yeah. But he sees that, <laughs> he sees Goliath out there and he goes, look, anybody notice that guy? <laughs> you know, he's, he is railing on us and stuff. Uh, shouldn't somebody do something about it? And they're all, all they're strong angels, you know what I mean? messenger there yeah but we're we're strong but we ain't that strong i'm strong enough to run my own life without god but i'm not strong enough for the devil <clears throat> no the angels didn't say who is strong enough he said who is worthy and we know that christ is the only one and that's why god chose not to just leave him in heaven but to put him in us and put him in the church that's God, God's secret weapon is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, if we don't take advantage of that, then what are we going to use? You know, Christian armor? Because the other one says put on the armor of God. It's not Christian armor. It's God's armor. You know, Christian armor says, well, you just need to pray harder. You need to do this. And I have nothing against all that. But I tell you what, if it's not emanating from Christ, and if you're not secure in Christ, there's no hope. David walks out there, and he goes, look, this guy's uncircumcised, man. He's got no right here. There is this is God's land. <laughs> this can't happen. All right. <clears throat> now, great story, but what about us with our giants that are in our lives, that are getting us and kicking our butt? Well, that was David. <clears throat> yeah. All right. So here is this strong angel, and he's crying, who is worthy? And they're in heaven, folks, for God's sake. I mean, come on. Is there not anybody worthy in heaven? Well, if you go by your basic Christian understanding of worthy, it's full of people. But if you go by God's understanding of worthy, there is none. I mean, let's read a little further. And no man in heaven, not in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the scroll, neither to look in it. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look on it. All right, so they said, okay, there's no more tears in heaven. Where is this taking place at? <laughs> well, I'm just, I notice things, you know. I mean, I go, wait a minute, you know. And, the, and the, I'll tell you what the, the weeping is about in heaven. Why? I mean, come on. Why would you weep in heaven? People are, their view of what heaven is, everything's going to be just wonderful. You weep in heaven if Christ is not seen properly. And you're looking somewhere other than to Jesus. That, that'll make you cry even in heaven because all of our christianity won't i'll tell you what it won't hold up in front of goliath it'll hold up even less in heaven in front of the lamb okay 
So, you know, now is the time to get in the Word and to seek Him on a true basis instead of a religious basis. Get something that's real. Get something that'll change you. You know, you go to these conferences and they say, we're going to change the world. Folks, most people can't even change themselves. You know, what, why are we yelling we're going to change the world when we need changing? Well, but I just feel good when I hear that. Really? Really? Is it, it's, it's about feeling good? Yeah, if you go enough conferences in a year, you could actually sustain yourself like you're on you know, all those machines, you know, in the hospital, and it's pumping your heart, and it's making you breathe, and is he still alive? Yeah, he's, he's still alive. Well, is he, can he talk or say anything coherent? Not really, no. He's just your basic Christian. I mean, if, that, if, if that's what we want, if we just, you know, I mean, y'all have heard me tell the story of just turning on the radio. I, did, I, I, I would have my music blasting, all my Christian music, and, you know, drive down the road, and, and you just feel like you're wonderful, and you get out and, you know, somebody hit your car or do something else, and you lose it, you know. I mean, you know, um, we need to get rid of all the artificial things, and get Christ in a real way instead of, you know, well, you, I got Christ. I got saved. Now let me put him back on the shelf over here. And let me get all this other stuff, which primarily relates to gifts. And look what I got. You know, well, where's Jesus? Well, you know, I don't really need him anymore. I'm saved. So, I, so you know, just, you know, just be happy. Well, the father, you know, the father calls him son. The father is not happy with that. He doesn't care if you put anything else aside, but he does not want his son put aside. <clears throat> All right, so verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Oh, thank God for elders. Amen. <clears throat> one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of, Ju of the root of, the, of Judah, the, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the, the book and to loose its seals. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Let's see how far I want to be reading here yeah let's just let's stop well now let's go down just a little bit more and he came and he and he took the scroll out of his right hand of him that sat upon the throne and when he had taken the scroll four living creatures and four and twenty elders fell down bowed down fell down before the lamb remember you do not fall down do not bow down okay to, to anything, fell down um, before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden bowls and incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy. See, this is a new song now. They were looking in heaven for somebody worthy. And when this incident happened, all of a sudden it's going, look, we need to start singing a new song. Christianity needs to start singing a new song. Not Christians are the hope of the world. Christ is the hope of the world. And Christ happens to be the hope of Christians. You get Christ formed in you, you're a different person because it's not you. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, not I, but Christ liveth in me. But you don't, you, you, you either embrace that or as a doctrine or ignore that. And guess what? It is just you. And you're just going to be all that, that you, you know, you're going to have to face everything on your own and look to God way up there. Oh, Jesus. You know, that's the way we pray. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. He's right here inside of us as our life. He, he, he's not a visitor. See, we're supposed to be the temple. He's not, he doesn't come visit in the temple. You know, we visit the temple. He lives there. You understand what I'm saying, how I'm saying that? <clears throat> All right. So they sang a new song uh, saying, Thou art worthy to take the scroll and to open the book and to 
uh, and thou was slain and hast redeemed us to God. Didn't redeem us from hell. Doesn't say he hath redeemed us from hell. It says hath redeemed us to something. Most people are content to be redeemed from something and are never redeemed to, but the Bible says redeemed us to God by, the, by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and per, people and nation. All right, <clears throat> so here we have a lot of bowing down and a lot of falling down and a lot of worship. All the things, all the things that we were told not to do with any other image but the proper one. And in this case, the proper image that turned heaven around. Not, not earth, not hell, turned heaven around. Was in name the lion of the tribe of Judah. But if you just, if you go by your ears, you may misread what did this. So you have to turn and look. And when they looked, it says, when they looked, they saw a little lamb as though it had been slain. All right. So, um, <clears throat> what do you have worshiping here? What do you have worshiping? Every living creature, things in heaven, under earth, all just like, just like in Philippians, Everything in heaven, in earth, under the sea, all of that, it, it covers all of that. <clears throat> so then when you start comparing Philippians 2 and, and Revelation here, you begin to realize Philippians 2 talks about the one who was slain and therefore exalted on the throne. And in Revelation, you see a lamb who is exalted on the throne. In both cases... It is this selfless, self-giving, and in, and in 1 Corinthians 8, that turn the tide. Totally turn the tide. All right? So, interesting, the wording, because I only got a few minutes, I guess. Maybe we can go back to, <clears throat> let's go back to Deuteronomy 4. We'll see if I can make this here. Because... Uh, I didn't really comment on everything that was uh, in these scriptures. <clears throat> we read this. Okay, see if I got it here. Okay, it's verse uh, 15. And actually, I think it goes down to, I'm trying to find this because. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so I'm just going to read the last part, verse 19, and then verse 20. Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the heavens. But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of Egypt, out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as you are this day. All right. So, if you remember the fullness of these scriptures, it says... Do not, you know, when you were with God, when you were with God at that time, you didn't really see him. You heard him. Now, this is what happened in the book of Revelation. They didn't see him yet. They heard him. They heard his name, Lion. It wasn't until they turned and saw him that they saw the image, the true express image of God. Okay? So, now he says, okay, well, you, not these creatures and make sure you don't do this and corrupt yourself and make carved images and make any, a likeness of male or female, likeness of any beast on the earth, likeness of any winged thing, 
uh, that flieth in the air, likeness of anything that creepeth upon the ground, likeness of any fish that is in the water, like, um, uh, likeness of heaven and earth, moon, sun, moon, stars, any of that stuff, don't do it. But the Lord hath taken you and brought you out of Egypt. All right, well, let's, how does that fit in? Well, I'll tell you how it fits in. It was the lamb that brought them out of Egypt. You remember the ten plagues? There was a, they, you know, there was a, flies and there was frogs and there was this. And, you know, he did, you know, Moses, uh, by the power of God, did a miracle, turned the water to blood. Pharaoh wouldn't let him go. No. Next one, no. Next one, no. Another miracle, no. Another miracle. I just need another miracle. No. You know, and another one, no, no, no. Finally, what gets them free? What really does the trick? They kill a lamb. It's a slaughtered lamb. <laughs> Sound familiar anywhere? Book of Revelation, Philippians, all of the scriptures we've been looking at, you know. It, it was a lamb. And, and when no miracle could get them free, when no, and that's what he's, you know, the, this strong angel, he's flying in heaven and going, look, I'm strong, and we got stuff up here in heaven you guys don't have on earth, and certainly not under earth, but you know, we got a problem up here, and it doesn't seem to be anybody worthy until he turned and he looked and he saw a slain, the true Greek there is a slaughtered lamb, one that would lay himself down to bring about the change. The image express image of God the only image that God would allow and so uh, let's go back to uh, let's go back how much time have I got three. three minutes okay let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 real quick 2 Corinthians chapter 6 now this was the one that we read um, uh, verse 16 for what knowest thou let's see wait a minute I'm in first I can't believe it 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16 and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols for ye are the temple of the living God as God hath said I will dwell in them so, do you see what he's saying here he's saying what what do you do? He's calling them the temple of God, and he's talking about idols in us. And he says, look, I already said you're my temple, and I will dwell in you, and you will be my people. Do you see, do you see the emphasis there? The emphasis there is you're the temple, and I'm supposed to live in you. And any other image that you form based on it not being my nature and the Lamb, is going to end up being wrong. And they said it in De uh, Deuteronomy 4, lest you corrupt yourselves. The devil did it. No, you corrupted yourself because you heard stuff. You heard lion of the tribe of Judah, and you assumed you were going to see a big old strong lion sitting on that throne going, yeah, you know, what's a, As Aslan or whatever his name is. <laughs> Sorry, but, you know, I mean, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for, ah! and he says to the Philippians, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ, who thought it not something so important to grasp after their reputation and grasp after their rights and all this. And then he turns to the Corinthians and he says to them, look, you got a problem with idols and you guys are right over here. There is no real idol, they're, so they're not really eating the idols. But your knowledge, your theology is messing them up when you're supposed to be laying by, by Christ, living by Christ and laying down your life. And that's the life that we're supposed to be living, and you don't even have that because you formed an image based on your rights and your knowledge instead of based on Christ the crucified being in you. Amen. I'm glad I got it all out. All right. Take a break. <laughs>